calling I can even hear a sound. And on when you are to talk, there we go. I 
Am I the only one who has a problem with internet connection? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello? Hi, Z. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hi everyone. Um, no, you go. Um, yes, you and Diva. Yes, I can hear you now. Zilu, are you able to hear me? I am able to hear you. Can you hear yeah. me waving? So, what I wanted to suggest, what I, I, I can, but I, I mean, I can see you. But what I would suggest is that maybe everyone disables their video, and then the people that are speaking then will enable their video when they speak, and then the same thing will go for microphones. So if you're not speaking, can you try um, disable your mic because just to avoid the background noise and connection issues? Because I have a, I have some hiccups with connection and and having videos kind of um, adds to that. So if everyone can just disable videos and mics and then. And as we engage, whoever is speaking can just switch on their mic. Thank you. What's happening? <laughs> I'll just wait for the indication from you, Namdiga. Okay, hi again, everyone. So I'm just going to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear me, can you go to, I think at the bottom of your screen, you should have a couple of icons and one of them says raise your hand. So if you are able to do that and you can hear me, can you, oh, nice. Okay, great. Oh, hey, hi. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay, great. So I think there's about seven people in the room and a, a number of them are staff members from Activate, but I do see that there's other one or two people that I think, I don't know if Danielle works with IJR and Ingrid, but thank you for being present and thank you for being in the space. I wanted just to give it a bit of time, maybe five to 10 minutes, well, from one, to just um, allow for a few more um, attendees to join the room because we actually had a, a large number of people um, confirmed for this meeting. We had about 27 people. So, and I know that it takes time for people to actually note webinar reminders. So I've asked to MK if he can just do a quick reminder in the different platforms where he's, he's put Put out the messaging on the webinar and then we can just allow for some time for people to come in so we will be starting shortly
um, it's 1.08 now, so I'm just wanting to give it another two minutes, and then at 10 past one, we're definitely going to start, because I think the conversation is relevant either way, and the speakers that we have today are people that have never spoken in the other platforms where we've engaged, and I think that's something for us to take advantage of. So I'm just going to allow for another last two minutes, and then we will officially start at 10, um, and we'll just start off with some introductions on the project, and then we'll get straight into it, and we'll have our speakers. And then what I've done is on the handout section. So at the top of your little dashboard on the webinar, you'll note that there's chat, people, poll, Q&A, and there's seven handouts. So if you go on there, you'll note that some of those handouts, well, those handouts are actually Twitter chat questions from the Twitter chat that we had last week, Friday, which is an engagement that forms part of this dialogue and forms part of this project. So I was thinking that maybe after our speakers have spoken and we're starting to engage, maybe we can make reference reference to those um, handouts as well, because they also give bigger context in terms of the research that we've done on the project and some of the questions and, and our points of curiosity as, as, as um, organizations that are working on this project. So yeah, so we'll start officially in a minute. Okay, so we'll start. Um, 
I do hope that everyone can hear me still. So I'm just going to type actually on the chat box that I've started speaking. And if someone can't hear me, they must just um, let me know in case this, there might be someone. Great, so welcome to this webinar um, on gender and human rights, focusing more on commitments and actions. Um, so this is part of a project that Activate and IJR are working on, on interconnectedness and, and inclusivity. It's really nice to see excitement and I'm also as excited. Um, and I just wanna say that this is obviously the first time that we are hosting this particular webinar platform and that it is a some form of a trial run and I guess a, a learning process for us as well. So I think we should all just be patient with ourselves, especially with the staff members and, and the people that are working on this project, um, but also acknowledge it as, as another necessary space that we can start to advantage of and using and as a platform to engage. So, so, so Activate and, and the Institute for Justice and, and Reconciliation are working on, on this project on interconnectedness and inclusivity. And at the moment, we are currently focusing on the theme of gender and gender-based violence. Um, and we've had a couple of engagements in different platforms. We've had hackathons, we've had a Twitter chat, we're having this webinar, and we actually hosted a, a human rights in these on the 21st of, of March. I'll speak a bit more briefly, I mean, a bit more <laughs> in detail around that. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping, because I'm trying to upload an infographic that was developed as part of the concept onto the handouts page as well and hopefully I can also share that with you and maybe help have that help us drive the conversation as well. But before I get into the context and the content of the webinar in itself and introduce our speakers, I would like um, for Eleanor, if you can, from IJR to just share briefly around um, IJR's involvement in the project and just maybe briefly as well around the, the context and the concept of this project and why we're here and are having this conversation today. Um, hi there, Namtiga. I hope you can hear us from our side. Okay, I'm not sure whether Eleanor is able to hear me. Sam, can you try? Can you? Yes, can you can you find out? I know Sam is can hear us, so and I'm not sure if it's Eleanor, but can you can you just try find out if maybe Eleanor is aware of the fact that she's supposed to speak? <laughs> A WhatsApp now saying that she she was struggling to communicate. Okay, so Illinois is, is apparently having technical difficulties, and I can understand. We did have a test call a couple of days ago, and and I we I mean she did still have she wasn't able to to speak. So Les, if you don't mind, maybe just giving a brief background on this project and and why we're here, very briefly. Thanks. Good afternoon. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, so she can speak. Oh, that's great. Um, apologies. Um, unfortunately, it seems like there must be some kind of technical um, difficulties on our side, but let me not um, keep us up any longer. Thank you for your patience. Um, so as you know, we are, we've had quite a few engagements on 
um, gender-based violence, um, just trying to unpack what are some of the root causes um, of gender-based violence and how can we, um, in addressing those, how can we start creating spaces where um, all gender identities feel comfortable, feel able that they can contribute in a way that they can um, Activate and IJAR have been working um, together since last year and we thought that this is an important conversation that we need to have um, just given the, the the high rates of gender-based violence in South Africa um, but also just the everyday microaggressions that that men and women face just because of, of gender. Um, one of the, the reasons why we think that this is also such an important conversation is if we want to think about um, reconciling as South Africans, the we we, we can't reconcile as a nation on any level until we are not reconciled as genders. Um, right. So so the the aim of this space, um, as Nomtika had said, is just for us to talk a little bit more, to to delve a little bit deeper, um, and then just to think about how do we how do we um, sensitize people around the various forms of gender based violence, and how do we understand um, how these gender dynamics operate within a broader spectrum. So I think just from my side, a very short um, intro, but I think it will be good for us to just get straight into it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Namtika? Yes, great. Thank you so much. So, as Eleanor had as mentioned, Eleanor. Um, I'm just going to take you through just very briefly some of the things that came out from from our, yeah. our concept, not necessarily the statistics, um, but just in terms of um, summing up some of the things that we've picked up. So with the high ongoing incidence of rape and the perpetuation of rape culture, as well as other forms of physical and psychological violence against women, girls, and the LGBTQ community, um, it represents a, a profound social challenge that affects communities across the South African society. And so our, our efforts to build a peaceful, interconnected, and com a cohesive community across the country must be aware or cognizant of this need to address these challenges. And all of that obviously starts with having these engagements, identifying these root causes and, and engaging around how can we move forward, working from, and not necessarily evidence-based, but more um, context and content and also evidence-based um, sort of framework or, or, or strategy as a way to address um, gender-based violence. And so this specific webinar really will speak around some of the lessons that have been learned in other ways and forms of um, engagement that people have, have have sort of used in their strategies. So we have Lance, who is a lecturer on gender at the University of Cape Town, and he's also a co-founder of a pro-choice youth-led organization called Just Choice, which has worked on a couple of um, on gender related, but specifically related to sexual and reproductive health, but centered around around our own gender and, and the key populations on HIV prevention, but also looking at that through an intersectional lens. So Lance is going to share a bit more about that project, but also some of the lessons learned and some of the key issues that came out. And then we also have Uzilungile, who is currently working with Activate, but also in her independent capacity has been exposed and has lessons to share around engaging within rural settings and in rural communities around gender and gender sensitization in addressing gender-based violence. And so um, I will hand over to Uzi Lungile first to, to take us through just some of the things that she's identified or what she's keen to share. Zilu, you're more than welcome to enable your video. Um, on my end, I don't have the best internet connection, so I don't know how that will affect me per se, but I think we've tested it just before we started. So maybe you can go ahead, and if maybe the other people that are sharing the space with Uzilungile can not speak or at least mute their yeah. mics, that would also be helpful because we, we need to, as much as possible, try and avoid background noise. But also just before we start, I just wanted to mention that um, the issue and the conversation around gender and gender sensitization, there's a lot of learning and it's a learning process and it's an engagement process and therefore how we engage in the space is important um, to try and, and, and create this enabling space where we can be able to, to speak and, and, and engage without necessarily feeling like we're not necessarily uh, we're not able to engage. So no one should feel silenced. You can be confident in asking whatever question you feel like asking. Um, unfortunately, and maybe this is a lesson for me as well, I don't have a private Q&A tab. So every question that you post on the Q&A session will be public. Um, there's some background yeah. noise. In. So every, every question that you post will be public. Um, but also 
if if anything, maybe you can just indicate on the group that if there's a particular issue that you're not necessarily comfortable with, and maybe we can engage around that more. So just to say that this is an open learning space for everyone. And MK, who is with the social media team within this project and from Activate, has asked if we can tweet as well and hashtag the com um, committed to change and mention our handles and just share what this is what this platform is meaning for you. So Zilu, if you can go first, you have about five to seven minutes to speak and then we'll have lunch and then afterwards we can just engage so that we also don't take too much time. Thank you. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Um, okay. uh, my name is Zilungila Zimela. Um, I come from Port, Port St. John's in, in the Eastern Cape and uh, it's predominantly a rural space. Uh, I think um, the whole issue of gender for me has been one that has been um, an interesting issue. Um, sexuality, where I come from, is uh, stigmatized largely. And it is very interesting to interact with uh, people of all um, ages from where I come from um, in terms of trying to raise an awareness. Um, when you present yourself as either a lesbian woman or a gay person, you are stigmatized, you are demonized, you are objectified. It's a lot of things, really. And it, it, the onus is on you, the subject, to educate people, to feel like you must educate them. Um, I always say that I, I don't think as human beings we should condition other human beings on how to treat other human beings. The only thing that we need to do is to make them aware that um, life is not a one-size-fits-all. We all make different choices depending on what our of reference and also depending on our preferences. So I've had uh, the best of both. Um, I've experienced the good, I've experienced the bad. Um, the bad in the sense that there, there'll be some name calling because people do not understand what you are or what you're trying to be. Um, I've also experienced a lot of love as well, a lot of acceptance. Um, thank God I've not been exposed in a situation where I've been physically violated. But when you go to places like the taxi ring, there will always be those snide comments from people who don't understand um, your very existence. So, But my passion is in educating young people um, on what it is that they need to do when they need when they have to respond to these things. Sometimes you don't need to respond. Just live your life and um, try to be safe in as much as it is possible because we know how ugly it can get. Um, so those are those have basically been my experiences. And I also come from a Christian family as well. Um, it becomes interesting when I have to either go to a funeral or church or a wedding. Um, your existence in that space is also um, ostracized. You you can all almost see the snide looks and night comments but you know onwards and upwards um, we are in 2018 and we have never been at a point in our lives where we are more socially aware of what is going on in the world and it is then our duty um, the people who have the knowledge to pass it on to other people as well so that we raise this awareness and yeah so those basic those are those are basically my insights for now so thank you very much for having me in the space back to you Namtika. great Thank you so much, Zilu, for that. I do have a couple of um, questions, but I will allow Lance to speak now, if you're ready, Lance, and then we can we can have our Q and A sessions afterwards. So, Lance, if you if you're ready, okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I think people can hear me either way. Um, Hello everyone, so my name is Lance um, and I have done, I've worked to work on, on, on a number of projects addressing issues of, of gender-based violence um, and we've looked particularly at queer communities um, and members of the LGBTIQ community in particular um, in trying to create spaces of sensitization and conscientization around issues of violence, okay? Um, so, I mean, they are, they are, violence is a very complex issue in our country, and I think that it's very important that we always locate our conversations in, in systems and structures, both current, current systems and structures of oppression and privilege, um, and also as a starting point to think about historical, the historical oppressions and how that has been kind of drivers for different forms of violence. Um, 
and we and when we talk about violence, I think it is important that we understand that violence is not just a kind of one dimensional concept, especially in our context. I think that we need to think about structural violence. Um, we need to think about institutional violence. We need to think about um, interpersonal violence and kind of these microaggressions that that was mentioned earlier. And then hegemonic forms of violence, dominant forms of violence, dominant ideas, dominant ideologies that reinforce violence. Okay, and how these factors or these different layers that violence operate at, how do they interact with each other? So, for example, how does structural violence facilitate? Um, interpersonal violence and an example and 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 we know that masculinity and violence there's a complex relationship between um, masculinity and violence globally but particularly in our context and 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 for me I mean I've been working quite a bit in thinking about how do we engage men in trying to think about violence Um, and trying to sensitize men around issues of violence, but particularly issues of violence that are not just at an interpersonal level. I think that we need to consider structural structural levels at which, um, or structural drivers at least, of violence, and and how do they determine what happens on the ground? Um, and, And patriarchy is one of those structures that we seek to address. And so what what the work that I've been do, been engaging in is to be able to engage men in feminist ideology. And and many, I mean, many people, there are a lot of contentions in these terms that we use, but particularly in feminism. And I think that we, without thinking about how fem, the complexities of feminism um, within our within our context, but, uh, especially because the, the term feminism is a Western notion, is a Western idea, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't care for the language as much as I do about the practice and the ideas that feminism and the tools, because many of our mothers, many of, um, of the women within our different spaces have drawn on and have used feminism before feminism was even, you know, before my mom doesn't even know about what feminism means, but she has been a feminist in the, in the things that she does. And so how do we think about women's agency? And how do we get men to think about women's agency Um, and the agency of the LGBTIQ community and other oppressed groups, children in particular? So for me, for me, a bigger question is how do we center oppression and how do we engage men in decentering themselves? And I think that there's an there's an important and what I mean by that is how do we how do we how do we not position men at the center? Because men are, including myself, men are, um, if you think about hegemonic or dominant forms of masculinities, patri- and, and within a patriarchal system, men are positioned in, in privileged positions. They, they're privileged in, in their bodily aesthetic, in, 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 in the ways that they are, that they are represented in, 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 in general, in the ways that we construct men and ideas about men. And all these kinds of kind of dominant ideas about what a man should do and how a man should behave within cultures, within institutions, within our everyday experiences, these kinds of messages, these different ideas, whether it's in Christian spaces, whether it's in religious spaces, whether it's in our, it's our, in our families, how men should behave does fuel violence. And but but how do we get men to engage with this patriarchy and this privilege that they exist? How do they how do we engage men with understanding their positions of privilege? Um, and how do we how do we challenge their complacency? How do we challenge their them reinforcing these systems of privilege and power? And 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 particularly, how do we how do we challenge them in the ways? And these these can happen in the in the smallest ways. Men don't actively have to go out and, and abuse women, but that's our reality. So, as a starting point, I do think that we should be able to think about um, uh, the different forms of violence, and we should also think about then how do we engage men through feminist ideas to get men to think about themselves um, and reflect on their own positioning within broader systems that reinforce violence. So I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but I'm hoping that that can kind of um, um, get us to think about um, engaging men. Uh, Yeah.
Thank you. Great, Lance. Great. Thank you so much. That's actually a very good start um, in, in helping us steer this conversation around, especially in regards to engaging men. And it's quite unfortunate that um, we were not able to have anyone from, from AMEN because they actually recently just um, hosted a, a, a summit specifically um, for men. And, and a lot came out of that. And there's actually content around that, which I'm hoping to, to upload later on because I couldn't necessarily do that now because it's too big and this is a trial platform that we're using. So I'm just going to have two questions for each of the speakers. So I'm just going to ask one question each. And then after that, I, we can open up then the discussion for everyone else to engage and ask questions. And then maybe just before we finish 10, 15 minutes from now, I'm going to draw from some of the Twitter chat questions that we've had. Um, and then maybe we can also chat a bit more about those. So the first question for Wena Zilu is around um, specifically again, working in rural communities and engaging within rural communities. And so when we're now looking at um, taking the step towards addressing issues of gender and in whatever context. Um, so, so for example, we are having a discussion on gender and we're using a webinar platform and that would probably not necessarily be ideal. Mm -hmm. And even if that it were to be that way, um, it, how do we sort of contextualize or maybe what, what are some of the ways in which we can think about how we contextualize our approach there? Um, because for example, myself and Lance did, a, did one of our projects in the Eastern Cape in Bethel Store, which is not necessarily like Ekaikala, so it's not necessarily a rural community, but it's a, it's a township community. And there were learnings on our end in terms of how we create the space and how we, we engage within the space and, and how we position people and how we position ourselves, I'm sorry, within that context. And so just in terms of how we engage Classic Weza platforms, what are some of the things that we need to think about? What are some of the things that we need to prioritize? And and how do we how do we position ourselves, especially if it's a it's a it's a situation situation where we're wanting to go and create enabling platforms of, of engagements and, and so so basically the approach. Um, thank you very much, Namtiga. I think when we go to raw spaces to engage with people that live there about matters connected to intersexuality, gender-based violence and the likes, um, it is very important for us to observe the language that we use. And by the language, I mean exactly that. If you're going into a community in the Eastern Cape and you are there to address Bondo-speaking people or Kosa speaking people, it is very important for the person who's going to have the conversation to speak Isitosa and the correct kind of Isitosa. Because um, in my experience, this is what I have observed. When you go to a rural space um, that predominantly has you know, rural people living in it, they appreciate an outsider, so to speak, um, who speaks their language, who pays homage to their way of life. Um, because you will recall that people that come from marginalized spaces are very protective of their space. Um, they're very protective of the, of the kind of knowledge that they share or the kind of knowledge that they welcome in their space. Um, this is not to say that they are anti-civilization or they are anti-changes. No, 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 they are not. Um, so that's the first point that, that I would um, put across. The language is very important. And secondly, they may, this may be something that some people overlook, but it is also very important. Appearance is also very important. Um, I can never, uh, as queer as I am, I could never go to Parks and Johns to address people of my community and my head is not covered um, because the very nature of having a bald head um, in my community where I come from is a symbol of something else which is not necessarily good. But I know why I shave my head off. So such things, I need to, to, to pay homage and respect to those things. And... Um, uh, and 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 not just and not seem to be disrespecting the people, you know, because essentially I'll be going there for a fact finding mission, or maybe to tabulate some of the um, solutions that we can employ in those communities so that we limit the risks or the the advent the advent of gender based violence. So those are the things that I I, I think I would put uh, mainly um, at the top. And another thing that we need to do, I think we need to. Um, invest a lot of time and energy in conducting research of raw spaces and um, understanding the context of gender-based violence that is um, evident in raw spaces because I find that it differs. Yes, you have the same um, structural structural contributors, your misogyny, your patriarchy, matriarchy, and so forth. Those are still evident, but it is important to 
um, research these according to the different communities because um, patriarchy would be very different in a Zulu culture. It will be kind of different in the, in a Ndebele culture as well. So when you go into such communities, you need to understand those people fully. Um, and also, it is also in, important for for us um, as human rights practitioners that when we go and have such discussions, we don't impose our belief systems or um, our civilization or how mod uh, how modern we are um, on the people that we're trying to, on the people whose mindsets we are trying to change. Them. So it is um, extremely important for us to be cognizant of those things, and also um, it helps sometimes when you go into a community, you get a person who is from that community to extend the invitation to you um, so that you don't seem like you are intruding or you are invading um, their space. Because it is different when maybe a local um, ward councillor would invite a Nomtika or a Zulu to speak on a particular matter because they'll give the background and then you just come in and cement everything. So I think those are the things that we need to be really cognizant of. Um, but in as, much, in as far as it is possible, I feel like um, we are doing a lot of work, and the work that we're doing currently is geared towards positive change. I feel like we are on the right path, and we do need to devote a lot of time, and we do need to spend time in those communities to understand the kind of language and the and the frame of reference that we need to ascribe to. Thank you very much, Namdika. Great. Thank you so much, Zilu. And what I'm picking, especially in regards to, to the invitation part, Len, um, it's important for you to have someone from there inviting you, it would also speak to how we will have identified what we think is the problem in order for us to think that it is necessary to go into that community. Because if I'm not in that community, um, my levels of confidence on whether or not there's a particular problem um, are sort of questionable if I don't necessarily engage actively within that community or I wasn't necessarily um, invited, as you mentioned, to be to be part of that conversation within that community. So that's very important. That's what I'm picking up. Thank you so much. And then Lance, for you, in regards to men decentering themselves, I think this is a very important conversation because a lot of the times in a lot of platforms, we always hear people saying, um, you know, in order for us to achieve gender equity and gender equality, we need to have men being part of these conversations, you know, and not necessarily remove them and not have them in the space. And as I mentioned, you know, that there's recently been a summit where a group of about 100 or so men gathered to address particular issues, um, which, I mean, I'll upon sharing the, the 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 video you will get a sense of 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 some of the things that came out um but just before i get to the core question i just want to acknowledge Uka Songuba, who just joined us and you're asking what the motion is mm -hmm. so we're still talking around the issue of gender and human rights but right now um i was focusing more on the points that our speakers had brought out so uzilungile is speaking mainly around how we engage in rural communities and what are some of the things that we need to be cognizant of and how we check ourselves within that sort of space and and then Lance is speaking more around engaging men and 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 how and how men can sort of be active as whether allies or or however they they sort of participate in this space without necessarily centering themselves and so my question to you Lance in that regard is how do how would that look like because um i'm thinking around i mean you wrote a, a, an article actually for activate a long while back around men as partners in feminism and thinking about you know allyship and and support within the women's rights movement um for example having maybe a gynecologist that would get an award for a man you so let's say it's a black man or a man generally who's a gynecologist and re gets recognized for being a champion in addressing issues of systemic violence within the context of maybe offering abortion services. So maybe pro-choice men who are active in the space, who are speaking in conferences, who are everywhere leading, sit in decision-making tables. Um, so how to how do we how how are we framing or how are we seeing the whole the whole um, how are we seeing this conversation around men centering themselves within that context? So in thinking thoroughly actually around support and, and allyship and, and how men are positioned in some of these spaces and why is it important for us to be critical of that and to interrogate that more. Thanks, Namtika. I think that, I mean, I just want to again echo um, what um, Zulungile spoke about in terms of um, 
think about the the ways in which we engage. Obviously, my work is sent, is particularly based within urban spaces, and I do think that there is there needs to be an acknowledgement about the different positions we are talking from. Um, in relation to urban and rural spaces, because we've constructed masculinity very differently, and there is a need to be able to understand the complexity of masculinity in different spaces. And there is a danger that a lot of our work has been kind of um, projected across across different communities without actually having a, a deepened understanding about the complexities in that community. And also, when we construct violent masculinities. What do we mean by that and, and, and how does it operate differently in different spaces? But we, but we do know that patriarchy operates in different ways. Um, and, and I do think that when we, when, we, when we think about our work as human rights activists, particularly men, and I'm going to use an example in, for example, queer spaces. In queer spaces, particularly in the work in, in Cape Town, there has been a, there's been a big focus on um on on men in queer spaces there's been there's been this danger about particularly heterosexual white or oh, homosexual white men who's been doing and speaking on behalf of a lot of lgbtiq um, um, um individuals and peoples and communities and suddenly you get that kind of representation that is then again centered and i use that example to show how it is dangerous for us just to accept that men should be having these conversations through centering themselves. Men, men, I, I personally don't think that um, 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 men within challenging patriarchy, men should should not be held accountable to the ways that they engage about patriarchy. It's like white people engaging about how do they deal with their racism by themselves. So how do we how do we engage men in ways that we don't in the same way when we have conversations about racism and when we have conversations about destabilizing white supremacy and dismantling whiteness within our institutions we need to think about how do we dismantle patriarchy and and so um I personally think that heterosexual men um need to consider, and different kinds of men in, in a particular space, need to consider the ways in which they center themselves in this work and that they need to disrupt that privilege. Um, and so the, the intention might be great in order to mobilize men, and that's important. We need men doing this work. I'm not saying that, we, that, we, that men shouldn't be doing this work. What I am saying in the ways that, that men are engaged and the way men are champions, how do you reinforce and perpetuate patriarchy? And that's that's something that we need to need to really think about in the ways, and also women in in in, in doing um, and queer bodies and different kind of oppressed oppressed groups. How do we how do we perpetuate patriarchy in our human rights work in the programming? So if we design programs about gender based violence and human rights issues, how do we continuously and persistently reinforce patriarchy? And center men, and I think that's something that we need to think about, um, and 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 we need to be mindful about what strategies um, we can use because we need to be centering women. Women should be constantly uh, 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 an important um, center point, and 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 in our space, black women, black women should be the the center point in which we understand um, oppression and privilege. And 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 it's from black women's and the intersections of black women's experiences that we start understanding what are the ways in which we can engage meaningfully to disrupt broader systems. Um, and you and there are a number of strategies that we can do that. And I, I'm suggesting a few here. The one way that, that that we can really think about it is to be able to the Me Too campaign was a very important campaign to be able to get women to be at the forefront of doing this work. When we think about movement and mobilizing and the fees must fall and the roads must fall movements at UC at the University of Cape Town, we could see that in those movements, men were silencing women in those spaces, right? And so and 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 yet they were claiming to be an intersectional movement by considering everyone's expressions or, or at least everyone's experiences and everyone's oppressions. I mean, so how do we and, and you could see that a lot of queer bodies and a lot of um 
um, women, black feminists in particular, were then left the movement because they felt like patriarchy was perpetuated. So how do we how do we create spaces where we actually centering women and we acknowledge the work of women um, and women as leaders in, in, in this work and that men actually do the background work? How, how do we champion for gender rights and gender activism when, when, when what we re are representing is dangerous and is, and, and, is, and is positioned as privilege? How are we champions in the work that we are doing, but we are foregrounded, that we should be able to actually take back seats and do the dirty work and allow women to lead us in different ways. And I think that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. That's a very important point, Lance. Thank you so much. We are unfortunately running out of time. We literally have 12 minutes left and I do need to end the call because I also have my shot picking me up then. So I'm going to get straight into one of the questions, one of our, our second question, sorry, um, from Daniel Dupree. Uh, pardon my pronunciation. But the question is basically how can we stand together to say no to LGBTIQ violence and is LGBTIQ rights not also human rights? So I'll first allow the speakers to very briefly answer, but then also I'm opening up now the invitation to pe for people to chat now on the chat box um, and just maybe share your insights and reply. And then if we are able to, and then if we are able to have maybe one or two of our participants also say something, that would also be great. So I'm hoping that Zilu and Lance's responses will be coupled by a couple of responses on the chat box. And then maybe if there's anyone who'd also, who's also interested in saying something, one or two things, if you can please raise your hand, then I'll, I'll note you and then maybe you can share that, your thoughts as well in this regard. So again, the question, Zilu, you'll go first. Um, oh, you've, you've responded. So the first step is to acknowledge that these injustices are happening in the spaces where we're supposed to find safety and comfort. That alone seeks to say that it's never easy to root out violence from the root without feeling intimidated. We then, as human rights activists, need to arm ourselves with wealth of research and create conducive, safe and effective spaces of reporting these crimes and offering support, tangible support and protection to be precise. So thanks for answering that, Zulu. So Lance, I don't know if maybe you'd like to add a few things or is that... Is Lance? Sorry, I lost you, Domtika, for a little bit and I don't know why. Um, okay, sorry about that. I don't know if you got the question yeah. that I had asked. Okay. Yes, how can we stand together to say no to no? <laughs> sure. Yes. Is LGBTIQ plus violence rights not also human rights? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course it is human rights. LGBTIQ rights are human rights. But it cannot be limited to just human rights. It's, un it's important for, for, for us to understand the humanity of LGBT um, IQ rights. Humanity is important, but it cannot be limited there to that because LGBT IQ people's needs and the experiences are very different to, to just fundamentally um, understanding um, human rights. And we need to consider those complexities and those differences of different oppressed groups. I think just overarching it as human rights is 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 is, is a challenge, um, and we need to. And and again, it, it brings this question around understanding the complexities of how we use these notions, because human rights implies particular things, right? And human rights also re, re, um, implies a responsibility um, on the individual to be able to exercise and, 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 and access those rights. And we know that within our systems, it's very difficult to even um, meet the aspirations of those rights. We, and, and many people don't even, have, don't even understand what those rights are, never mind beginning to access them. So we need to understand how, these, how, what, how different LGBTIQ rights are um, in relation to our broader human rights. And also, I mean, I just want to come back to the to one particular statement about about kind of human rights. We should, I think, my personal opinion is that we actually should dictate how people should treat people, um, especially when when that treatment is a treatment of violence. I don't think that that violence at various levels is okay, and that we should be silent and and it being okay with um, the treatment and the human rights arguments 
is 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 sometimes limiting in addressing um, many rights of many people, but in this case, LGBTIQ rights, because what it does is that it can easily trample one right over the other. Um, because you'd you'd say that, but people have a right to 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 religion to religion religious ideology, and completely dismiss um, LGBTIQ people from coming to their church, right? But that for, what is the danger in that ideology being perpetuated in our society, and what and 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 how does that rhetoric? Um, how does that actually facilitate issues of gender-based violence within our communities? Um, and, and I don't think, I personally don't think that, that a human rights approach or just understanding that people have rights um, is sufficient. I think that all, mm. of, all, of, all of our systems need to be challenged consistently within the framework of human rights. Thank you. Great. Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lance. Eleanor, you had your hand up. So we do have some time for you to say something. Eleanor? Eleanor, are you still keen to say something or should I move on to MK's question? Eleanor is saying that the audio is challenging. Okay, okay, no worries. So maybe you can just ask the question or share your comment on the chat box as well. That would also be useful. Thank you. So MK also um, asked, um, do you think if we have allies in all spaces that would create a better society to some degree? I'm not sure if I understand what you mean, MK, by in all spaces. If maybe you'd want to clarify that or or if maybe Lance, Zilu, or any of our other participants feel that they they would be able to answer this question. So you can just maybe raise a hand and then we can, I, we can, we can. Okay, Lance um, or Zilu? Can, okay, can, sure. Sorry. Can I add to this question? Um, yes. Um, Kululu. Can you hear me, Namtika? Sorry, I broke up for a bit. Yes, I got, yes, I did. I, I did sort of lose you a bit, but I can hear you now. Okay. Um, so the, the, the issue of thinking about having allies in all spaces, I mean, that's how we build collectives, right? That's how we have mobilized communities um, to be able to, and if you think about grassroots activism, it is about building allies and, and building constituencies across different spaces, that's important because it, what's very difficult to build intersectional movements is to be responsive to everyone's oppressions, right? You can't, I mean, if you, if you build a movement that's centering issues of racism and, and you're fighting white supremacy, it's very difficult to, to, to build a movement that also will acknowledge um, the oppression of women, the oppression of LGBTIQ people. So, and and that this is the thing about an intersectional tool. And this is something that 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 I've that I've mentioned a bit earlier, but didn't really expand on it. In an intersectional movement, an in, intersectional tool is recognizing all oppressions and the interconnectedness of oppression. That you do, you are not just black. You also we also you also sometimes black and queer. You're also black queer and you're a woman. You're also black queer woman with disabilities. And it's very difficult for some oppressions to be recognized and realized within when fighting for a particular oppression. And so it is important that when we, when we build um, different spaces, yes, of course we need different allies and we should be connected and particularly Allies with, should be able to listen into a process in the same way that heterosexual people should, should enter in, into a, into LGBTIQ space or queer space and listen and take in narratives and understand what it is that the, that the fight is about in the same way that when white people enter into a movement and a space that wants to fight issues of racism, that they, that they come in and listen and they don't take up space, they don't take up voice, they don't come and delegitimize the oppression that, they, that, they, that they're trying to be allies towards and that they're consciously mindful about how they operate in the space that doesn't reinforce 
the structures and systems that, and sometimes it is, you'll find that white, white people want to speak the most in black spaces. Men want to speak the most in women's spaces. Um, and so when we build allyship, we need to be thinking about understanding the oppression and not the privilege. We can't have, we can have men mobilizing and having conversations, but we need to be holding a men, a men accountable to the conversations that they are having about their privilege in the same way that we need to be holding white people accountable about the conversations that they're having about their racism because they are privileged by the system. And it's very difficult for them to understand the complexities of oppression. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Lance. Les, you just made a comment. I'm not sure whether this is what the issue that you wanted to raise, um, but you've mentioned that there's still a huge disconnect in our society among organizations and people who are working to deal with um, issues of masculinity and gender discrimination. So, Les, I don't know, maybe you want to say something very quickly on that, um, or are you sorted? Liz? I just, just very quickly. Okay. I think I just, I can just emphasize a little bit on that. I think yes. I absolutely agree with what, what Lance is saying, but also mm -hmm. I think even, even within organizations that are trying to deal with the issues of gender um, masculinity and gender discrimination and others, there's still such a huge disconnect. It's almost like there's a competition of who's doing it better than who, you know, and I think, and that is why this project was started. This is why we wanted to promote more inclusive and interconnected communities so that organizations that are dealing with similar issues can actually come together and work together. And the question that we are asking here is, what are some of the commitment and connections that we are willing to take together? So, Absolutely. We, we've had a lot of conversations about this. Even during the Imbizo, we've got, we've had a lot of organizations coming in, like Sweat coming in to say, we are welcoming everyone to come into our spaces. But I think because of such a huge disconnect, so we are actually unable to actually pull in people in. And the issue of, of allies in marginalized communities, absolutely. But I think even, even if we might have allies in such communities, we shouldn't silence people. There was a good point that was made earlier about uh, Lance saying that uh, white people want to dominate black spaces. So it's the same thing. If I'm an ally of uh, LGBTIQ plus community, I shouldn't go there to silence people. I should be going there to support and wanting to hear. So, so I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But yes, like Zilu was saying earlier, work, it's, we have started. We have started moving towards working together, which is great. But the disconnection is quite huge, even amongst the guys that are actually working on it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our conversation. And this is only the first conversation. And I, it was really important for us to also be able to see whether this is a platform that we can use to, to engage. Um, so we've we've basically reached the end of of today's webinar unfortunately i'm hoping that we can be able to make some time um and and create the space again because we've we've really worked on very very limited time and and i think an hour was not necessarily enough but at the same time because of not knowing whether or not this was going to work i yeah. had to sort of limit it to that so thank you so much to our presenters uzilungi lenolans for the insights that you've shared and thank you so much to those of you who've been able to engage in this platform but also to the person who started the poll on do you think the lgbtiq community is forceful <laughs> in probing society to accept them and would a more subtle <laughs> approach help? Good so I, <laughs> that and, was me. Great. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Zilu. This is very necessary. It's a very good question. <laughs> so. <laughs> So this is very nice. Thanks so much. Um, I don't know. I'm going to leave this open for another five minutes or so. But the webinar has been recorded. I'm hoping that as soon as I stop the recording, maybe within 24 hours, I can get the copy. And then I'll share this with everyone so that we can also share it publicly to say that this is another space that we have that we've created and we've had this discussion. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we have reached the end of, of our conversation. I'm not quite sure. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Bye. I know, me too. I want more. It's just I had to time it this way. <laughs> Stop recording. Are we stop?